thank you for the way you worship the Lord Jesus Christ and celebrate his resurrection. What a great crowd this morning. In spite of a uh, flu epidemic going around our county and so many that are uh, in uh, Colorado today at the opening of uh, Overland Church, I'm so glad that you're here. We're studying through Luke and we're in that passage in chapter 3 about the ministry of John. Now Luke never calls him the Baptist, but as a Baptist preacher, I like to add that part. Uh, but uh, he's talking about the ministry of John. Remember how he set up uh, by telling us those infancy narratives about the birth of John and then also the birth of Jesus and told us about the boyhood of Jesus. And then uh, he dates, remember the beginning of chapter 3, very carefully dates the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. And we've seen about John's preaching. He's preaching a message and a baptism of repentance. There are some that come to him that want to be baptized. He refuses them. He says, no, you need to show the fruits of repentance. And, uh, and, he, and Luke quotes from Isaiah and tells us from Isaiah chapter 40 that John is the fulfillment of this. He's the one who goes before the Messiah. He prepares the way. And as John preaches repentance, he's asked by three different groups. Remember the, the crowds, the tax collectors, the soldiers, each asking, what must we do? And John tells them what repentance looks like in their lives. He doesn't tell them to withdraw from their lives. He says, go back to your life, but go back different. And then we pick up the message in verse 15. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Now you recall, Luke began this gospel in chapter 1, those first four verses, by addressing this gospel to a man named Theophilus, which means beloved of God. And he told him his purpose was so that he might know with certainty these things. That there were other gospels that had been written, some of them inspired, perhaps we believe that Mark was written before Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke seem to have had some similar sources, but each of them some unique things that they tell us about Jesus that the other gospels don't have. There were other gospels that had been written that weren't necessarily inspired, but were true uh, accounts of the life of Jesus. So Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wanted to write this down so that we would know exactly who Jesus is and exactly what he did. And part of his account, an important part of his account, is the ministry of John, because John had had such a major impact. Remember, uh, as, as all throughout what you and I know as the Mediterranean world, uh, remember in Acts chapter 19 when Paul gets to Ephesus, there are disciples there that they knew about John's baptism and Apollos that Aquila and Priscilla meet there in Ephesus in John, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 18. They, he knows about John's baptism. So the ministry of John was well known throughout the Mediterranean world, but Luke wants Theophilus and you and I, as others who are beloved of God, to know exactly who John is in relation to Jesus and that John is not the Messiah. There's only one Messiah. There's only one 
who is the Son of God, and that's Jesus. And so he tells us about John's ministry so that we, we get that. And John is not the Messiah. He's the forerunner. He's the one who fulfills that passage that Brother Chris read us from Malachi chapter 4. He's the one that has the, the spirit of Elijah. He's the one that his preaching would turn the, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. He's the one who comes in that spirit of Elijah. But ultimately, his great purpose was to point people to Jesus. And the greatest life is one that surrenders and testifies and points people to Jesus. Now, our, Luke doesn't tell us this. The other, one of the other gospels tell us this, but Jesus, remember Jesus said that of, of man born of woman, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. Now, that's the testimony of Jesus about John. But what is great about John is that he's pointing people to Jesus. That is his sole purpose. And so we're just going to look through these verses. <clears throat> we're going to see what's going on in the ministry of John. And with each description of what we see in these verses, there's also going to be an instruction that we're going to deduce from this. All right? So we're going to look at some words, and then we're going to see an imperative statement. What do we do? because of what this teaches us. What's happening in the ministry of John? Well, the first thing is expectation. You see there in verse 15 that the people are in expectation. They are looking for something to happen. What is it they're looking for? Well, they're looking for the Messiah. Can you imagine? They live in a time where there have been four, it's been 400 years since Malachi wrote that passage that we just read. 400 years where God has been largely silent, not in history. He has certainly worked providentially, but he has not sent a prophet. Now, there have been false prophets, but the way you can always tell a false prophet is that they say at least one wrong thing. God's prophets in the Old Testament were always held to a standard of absolute truth. If anybody prophesied something that did not come to pass, God said, well, you know, that's a false prophet. Yeah, yesterday someone sent me a video, a guy that uh, I love. I used to pastor him years ago at another church, and he sent me a video, and it was prophecies for 2019. And I watched the first two minutes of it, and I wrote him back. I said, he's a false prophet. He said, well, how do you know? I said, well, the first thing is his prophecy comes with a disclaimer. And secondly, he used the word if. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the prophecies on this thing was that the sh government shutdown was going to last a long time. And it was already over by the time I saw the video. Uh, so how do I know he's a false prophet? Well, again, can you imagine John the Baptist or Elijah or Isaiah showing up and saying, now before I give you my prophecy, there's a disclaimer I need to add. God's prophets don't give disclaimers and they don't get something wrong. What God says will come to pass. So these people, had they were longing for a prophet, someone that they could trust. They'd seen false prophets, but now here's this man, John, and he's not like anybody else. He's preaching an incredible message and, and uh, they, they're looking for the coming of the Messiah because the Old Testament had promised it. The Daniel had dated it. Remember the book of Daniel gives those, those 70 weeks, a period of 490 years leading up to the ministry of the coming of the Messiah. And this is how, remember Anna and Simeon, when they saw Jesus in the temple as a baby, they were looking for the coming of the Messiah. And now the, there's this messianic expectation. Daniel had dated it. Malachi had guaranteed it. The difficult times in which they live with Roman occupation and an oppression of God's people, that created this longing in them for the coming of the Messiah, someone that would redeem them, the, the consolation of Israel to come, someone to reclaim the great throne of King David. So all of this is, is fomenting in the people this sense of expectation. Expectation. 
you can look for God to always keep his word. If God says he's going to do something, you can count on it. He's going to do it. And so they're, they're not wrong for this expectation. They're incredibly right because they look to the scriptures and they see the times. They know that the Messiah is coming. There's a sense of expectation. But with expectation, there also comes speculation. Do you see that? That Luke tells us that all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ. The most dangerous words any Christian ever said are, it seems to me. And the second most dangerous words are, well, what this passage means to me is, you ever hear that? I, it, it grieves me to think that all over this country in Sunday schools and Baptist churches, there are a bunch of people gathered this morning and somebody read a verse and then they went around the room and everybody got to tell what it means to them. That's a dangerous thing, you know. Uh, don't ever ask the question what it means to you. The question is what it means. What does it mean? Now, how do we know what it means? Well, as I've told you many times before, context is, context is everything. God always gives us a context in which he reveals his word, and he always tells us the truth. And so this is why we, we don't need to speculate. We can read God's word. If the Bible doesn't tell us something, it's because we don't need to know. How long did Adam and Eve remain in innocence before their sin in the Garden of Eden? I have no clue. I'm not going to speculate. The Bible doesn't tell us, so we don't need to know that. But I can look at the scripture and I can tell you how to be saved. I, I know how a man or a woman can come to faith in Christ and they can be counted righteous and be guaranteed eternal life. I know that because God knows we need to know that. He gave us that. So I don't need to speculate about things that the Bible doesn't say. I need to trust what I need to trust God's word, not my thoughts. So when they speculate, oh, might John be the Messiah? They should have known better because what does the Old Testament say? There's going to be a forerunner. There's going to be one who comes before the Messiah. So the fact that there was nobody who came before John should tell them he can't be the Messiah because he's the first one we've heard from for 400 years. And John ends all their speculation with what? With proclamation. John preaches. John openly avows, I'm not the Messiah. I indeed baptize you with water, but there is one mightier than I who comes after me, who's the straps of his sandals. I'm not worthy to unloose. Now, that, that's a very menial task. People who had servants when they would go home, that's the first thing that they would do. They would sit down and they wouldn't even deign to take off their own sandals. They would have a servant do that. And when John invokes this image, he's invoking the image of something that people would not want to do. He says, I'm not even worthy to unlace his sandals. He, he's mightier than I. So John is clearly a prophet and he speaks only truth. How do they... Trust his word. Well, you know, think about this. John never asked for anything for himself. John doesn't preach John. John preaches the Messiah. John doesn't take up an offering for him. He talks about going and doing works that are fit for repentance. His proclamation is clear. And he said hard things. Another way you know he's really preaching the word of God, he says hard things. He's not... He's not tickling itching ears. He, he says things like, you brood of vipers? Who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Some people came to him, we want to be baptized. You know, we, we want to join your church, pastor. And he said, nope, you can't do it. You go show me some fruit of repentance. See, John is a, he, he's a godly horticulturist. And if you're a horticulturist, what are you more interested in, root or fruit? Well, the reality is you've got to have both, right? That, that's what you need. And John says that. He, he talks about the root of repentance, but also the fruit of repentance. And 
he proclaims to them the truth. He's, he made discipleship hard. Go back to your life, but go back different. Don't live like you've always lived. You know, you look at churches today that they've done everything they can to make membership easy. Those, they've let down their doctrinal standards. They've let down their moral standards. They've let down their ethical standards. They, they've erased and eroded their distinctives of who they are. And, you know, these churches end up standing for nothing and they, they lose the gospel. Uh, I, I've learned that about everything good in life requires incredible commitment and it's hard. Marriage is hard. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Marriage is hard. It's hard. Church membership is hard. It's hard to really love one another and to provoke one another to love and good works and to fulfill the responsibilities of being a part of the body of Christ. It, it's not a light thing. It's not an easy commitment. Following Jesus is a hard thing. Jesus didn't say, take up your cushion and follow me. He said, take up your cross and follow me. John says hard things. And like John, you need to use your life to point others to Christ. Your life needs to proclaim, you know, I'm not the one. I don't have all the answers, but I can point you to the one who does. I can point you to Jesus. And John does that he, he says, I'm not the one. There's one mightier than I who's coming, and he's the one. And then look what he says. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, notice all, what tense is this in? It's in the future tense, right? He will. So this is what we call anticipation. John's preaching something that's true now. You need to repent right now. You need to be baptized right now. But now he shifts into the future tense. This one who's coming after me, who's mightier than I, he's got a different baptism than I have. I baptize you with water. He is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John says there's a greater one coming after him who has a greater baptism than what he administers. And he defines it in two ways. He says there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit and there's a baptism of fire. Now you might initially read that and think that he, that's just one thing. But it's two things because he goes on to explain that he's coming with a winnowing fork. Now what's a winnowing fork? You'd have to know a little bit about ancient Near Eastern harvesting practices, but there they would, uh, when they would thresh wheat out uh, in, on the threshing floor, they, the whole goal is to separate. You want to end up with just the kernel of, of wheat or barley, whatever your grain is. And so they would put it in these sheaves. They would take these sheaves to the threshing floor. They would beat that. They're trying to get the grain off of it. They would take a winnowing fork and they would get the, the, basically the straw out of there and it would leave behind the grain with the, the chaff. They would then, they would rub that grain. They would throw that grain up in the air. They would sometimes use a winnowing fan if there was no breeze or the breeze would blow away the chaff. The whole purpose is to separate and to get down to the, the one thing that is of profit, that's that kernel of wheat. Now, John pictures the Messiah coming with a winnowing fork, and his whole purpose is to separate the wheat from the chaff, to show what's real, what belongs to him, and what does not. And let me give you a big word here. These, these, these baptisms of which John speaks are eschatological. Now, that just means that they belong to the end times. Now, be careful here. Because a lot of times when I talk about end times or eschatology, you immediately think I'm talking about the return of Christ, the, what's future. But remember, 
in the biblical view, the last days are everything that happens from the point of Christ's resurrection on. So we're in the last days. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. So Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming to inaugurate, to bring the kingdom of God. But remember, we're going to see as we go through Luke that when he comes the first time, he's bringing this kingdom only to his followers. It's something that is within us. Now, one day he's coming and he's going to bring this kingdom externally. It's going to be in the world. But from the biblical prophetic perspective, that's all one event. Picture it, uh, I always say, picture it like you're standing on the Great Plains and you see the Rocky Mountains in the distance and you see all the different peaks, but you, don't, you, you have no sense of depth between them. You can't really tell which peak is closer. You can't tell if this one's 20 miles away and that one's 30 miles away or vice versa. You just see a range of peaks. And this is the way the, the, the Old Testament looks forward to these eschatological events. It calls all of them collectively the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord for the people of God is a great day, right? It's a day of, of being united with our God. It's a day of God making all things right. But for those that do not belong to him, it's a day of judgment. It's a day of horror. What we see as God making all things right, those that are opposed to God will see as, as God destroying them. It's both things. So John is looking forward to this is one thing. Now I'm just going to get a little bit ahead of myself and remind you. John disappears from the gospel of Luke at this point until chapter 7. And the next time he shows up, he's in jail. And he, can't, he, he begins to have some questions because Jesus isn't acting like he thought Jesus should act. And he sends his disciples to Jesus to say, now, are you the one or should we look for another? And that's not because John gets depressed because he's in prison. That is such a, a bad interpretation of that. Because Jesus, as, many, as soon as John's disciples leave, Jesus says, John's no reed shaking in the wind. So Jesus tells us that's not, that's not John having self-doubt because he's in jail and might lose his head. The thing is, is that John tells that Jesus is coming with a baptism in the Holy Ghost and in fire. And in the ministry of Jesus, we see, we see Jesus bringing peace, love, restoration to some people, but we don't see anything about Jesus bringing judgment. And so he doesn't really act like what John thinks the Messiah should act like. And that's why he's going, oh, I'm scratching my head. This doesn't make any sense to me. Where's the judgment? Where's the baptism with fire? And Jesus' answer to John's disciples is going to be, hey, you just go tell John what you see in here. That the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, uh, and, and the dead are raised to life. In other words, John, I am bringing the signs of the kingdom. I'm bringing the signs of the day of the Lord. It's not yet universal. It's not yet cosmic, but I'm bringing it. And when John hears this, he's okay. Now, I say this because I want you to you understand that if you are a little confused by this, you're in good company, right? John didn't understand it at first either because he's looking at the range of peaks. He's preached that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that baptism is eschatological. Each thing, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the baptism in fire inaugurate, they commence, they begin the age to come for the recipients. Now for the followers of Jesus, that happened on the day of Pentecost. That's when the baptism in the Holy Spirit came and Jesus baptizes his church in the Holy Spirit and empowers them. He gives us the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom, and we advance the gospel into the world. So for us, that eschatological age has begun.
But he's not yet come with the baptism of fire. He's not yet come with his winnowing fork. He's not separated the wheat from the tares or the wheat from the chaff. That's yet to come. And Jesus will, in his ministry, tell stories about that. He'll tell parables and he'll explain this. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for his followers. The baptism in fire are for those that are not. The wheat are gathered. The chaff is burned with unquenchable fire. I'll just remind you, Jesus talked more about hell than anybody in the Bible. And this is why we believe unequivocally in the doctrine of judgment and eternal hell. Jesus brings it. This is what John says. So how do we respond to this anticipation of what the Messiah is bringing? Well, we look forward to the day of the Lord. Because we're followers of his, we don't need to fear it. It has, in one sense, already begun for us. He's brought to us the blessings of the kingdom. It's like the future blessings of that age to come have reached back. We have fellowship with God. We have access to the most holy place. We can enter into his throne room. All of that that belongs to the age of the kingdom is true for us today in Christ. But you can only look forward to the, to the day of the Lord if you are one of his followers, if you've trusted in him. Years ago, during the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma, there was a terrible and destructive prairie fire. And it was raging across uh, the, the fields there. And there was a farmer who just had a few buildings, his house and a barn and uh, his hen house. And he saw that fire coming his way. And he knew that his only hope was to go ahead and start a fire around his building so that it would burn all of, of the grasses there and he could control it so that when the fire came close to him, it would, it would already have been burned. And so he lit the fire and he did all that he could to keep the, the flames from going onto his buildings as he let, lit these backfires. But the great fire came and it raged all around him and some of his animals were destroyed. After the flame passed the next morning, the farmer seeing that he had lost so much went out and his little boy was walking with him and he saw the charred remains of a hen, one of his hens there that had been burned in the backfire that he had lit. And he was just disheartened, having lost so much. He just sort of hopelessly took the toe of his boot and he just kicked that burned carcass. And when he did, four little chicks ran out from underneath those burned wings. See, that's exactly what God has done for us when the judgment of God came on Jesus Christ. He has gathered us under his wings so that as the flame of God's wrath raged on Jesus Christ, we were protected, we were saved, we have drawn life from him. You see, that's what we proclaim. We, we look forward to the day of the Lord because his judgment has already passed, not on us, but on Jesus in our place. And then comes John's exhortation. Look at verse 18. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Man, isn't it good news that the Messiah is coming? And for you and me, it's good news that he has come. The message of God's eschatological work is good news when we have accepted him. It's not merely a message of judgment nor merely a message of God's favor. It's a message of both. That in Christ, God has extended his favor and God has shown his wrath and his judgment on sin. And God is going to gather his people to himself. What's our response to this preaching that John gives us, this exhortation of the good news to the people? It's, well, let's take John at his word. Let's repent and obey. When we hear that, Jesus has come, the Messiah has come, he's taken God's judgment on himself. Man, this should cause us to see our sinfulness and to 
repent of our sin, and then as repentant followers of Jesus, our lives are transformed. Just like John told the crowd and, and the tax collectors and the soldiers, we go to our lives. We don't withdraw from the world. We live our lives, but we live them differently. We live them as repentant and obedient followers of Christ. But now in this narrative, Luke does something different than any of the other gospel writers. He puts here, not in chronological order, but he tells us while he's talking about John and John's baptism, he tells us what all the, gospel, the other gospel writers put much later, and that is about John's arrest. Uh, he's just... He's just wants Theophilus, and therefore you and I, the other beloved of God, to know that John can't be the Messiah because of what happens to him. And he says with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people, but Herod the Tetrarch. Now, uh, there are six Herods mentioned in the New Testament. So I know it can get confusing. The first one, that Luke is uh, that Matthew tells us about is Herod the Great, and uh, Herod the Great was the one who was called the King of the Jews, the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. This Herod is Herod Antipas. He's the son of Herod the Great. When Herod died, he was none of his sons were considered able to rule as he had ruled, and the Roman Emperor split up Herod's reign into really four parts and he gave three parts to Herod's sons and Herod the Tetrarch Herod is Herod Antipas he gets Galilee so he is the Tetrarch up in Galilee now remember Jesus is from Galilee and so he would have grown up under the rule of Herod the Tetrarch Herod Antipas and Luke tells us that Herod Antipas uh, eventually he takes John we know as the Baptist, and he puts him in prison. And why does he put him in prison? Well, he puts him in prison because he offends Herod the Tetrarch. He preaches boldly that, that Herod is guilty of adultery because Herod has an affair with his brother's wife and she divorces Herod's brother, Philip, and then they marry, and uh, they rule and reign together. And John just, he doesn't, doesn't care who he offends. He, he is an equal opportunity offender. And while he's preaching repentance, at some point he says to Herod Antipas, you're living with your brother's wife. That's not your wife, that's your brother's wife. Again, talking about the covenantal nature of marriage. Now, Luke mentions John's arrest here, even though it won't happen until later because he wants us to know that John, as a forerunner of Jesus, uh, does, cannot bring the fullness of the kingdom because if he did, a, witcher, a wicked tetrarch like Herod Antipas couldn't arrest him. So further, this is yet another wrong that God must right. Notice he says that Herod adds to everything else he did. He adds this, that he arrested John. He put John in prison. So what preaching is it that gets John arrested? It's a biblical view of marriage. And you just need to know that a biblical view of marriage will get you killed. This isn't the generic preaching of God's love. This is the specific preaching of God's holiness, especially in marriage. Now, Luke digresses at this point, so I'm going to as well. Did you see the uproar because our second lady, Karen Pence, is teaching in a Christian school that requires faculty and students to agree to a Christian worldview, particularly about sexual ethics? Now, if you just look back over the course of the last 10 years, you will see how radically our nation and even the world has changed on this. Uh, I, I, just, I just want to remind you just to sort of put this in the scope of history. Remember when ba Barack Obama ran for president the first time, he openly avowed that he was against gay marriage. You can look on YouTube, you can find a video of Hillary Clinton 
on the Ellen DeGeneres show in which she tells Ellen DeGeneres that she is against gay marriage. And yet, and by the way, and, and it was Bill Clinton who signed the, uh, the, the De Defense of Marriage Act that is today considered complete cultural heresy. And so you can see that even mainstream politicians, even those that would be considered on the left in American political spectrum, were against any other definition of marriage that recently. And yet today, an unelected person, the, the, the second lady of the United States who didn't run for anything, is pilloried in the press and castigated uh, by uh, the pundits for daring to teach in a Christian school uh, that is run by uh, the Emmanuel Bible Church. It's the Emmanuel, Emmanuel Christian School and the Emmanuel Bible Church. The pastor there is a graduate of uh, the Master Seminary in California where John MacArthur is uh, the one who started that. And they have a, just a biblical view of marriage. What uh, would really be unremarkable as recently as 10 years ago for any evangelical church. And yet today... And that will get you uh, figuratively stoned. The message of tolerance has not given way to the language, has now given way to the language of total domination and acquiescence to the sexual revolution. You will comply and conform, or you will be publicly shamed, pilloried in the press, and relegated to the most obscure corners of society. Now, I just want to remind you, this isn't new. It's new for our country, but it's not new in world history. John preached about the sanctity of marriage, and he got arrested and eventually beheaded. But it's okay. Because the one mightier than John is coming with his winnowing fork, and he will separate the wheat from the chaff. So you better let the world know which side you are on. And better, better to be identified with John and the one who brings, the one who's mightier than John than to be applauded and patted on the back by the world. Luke gives us an explanation and it's an important explanation because it's actually an application of what following Jesus is like. Luke wants Theophilus and you and I to know that following Jesus is hard. It comes with a cost, but it's okay because the one mightier than John is the one who's going to determine history. Every now and then somebody says, oh, you're on the wrong side of history. I guarantee you I am not because I serve the one who has the winnowing fork in his hand. And Luke goes on to tell us in verse 21 about identification. When all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now, let's... Let's talk about baptism for just a moment. This identification. Anytime you see baptism in the Bible, I want you to think identification. Baptism always means identification with something. So when John is baptizing down there in the Jordan, people come to him. They are identifying with what? Repentance and the coming kingdom, the coming Messiah. Uh, in the Old Testament, remember in 1 Corinthians 10, when Paul describes Moses and the children of Israel going through the, the Red Sea, he says they were baptized unto Moses in the sea and in the cloud. So he pictures them as they're immersed. And they go through the sea, the cloud hovering over them. They're, it's like a baptism they're baptized unto Moses. They're identified with Moses. They are the people of Moses as they're going through the sea. And every time you see baptism, it's identification with. 
So John is preaching a baptism of repentance, an identification with repentance. And here Luke tells us rather with a real economy of words. He uses less words about the baptism of Jesus than any of the gospel writers. He just simply says, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized. He doesn't give all the details that the other gospel writers do. He, he simply tells us that John had preached a message of repentance and John's promise of the kingdom and John's Messiah was Jesus. We know from the other gospel writers that Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And at first, John argues with him. He says, no, you're the one who should baptize me. But Jesus says, no, this is becoming, this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus doesn't come because he needs to repent. He's not baptized because he needs to repent. He's baptized to identify with the coming kingdom. He's baptized of John to say, yes, I, I am fulfilling God's command, this call to the kingdom. And Jesus submits to it. Jesus identifies with John in his message, even as those people did. Now, I think you see where I'm going with this, don't you? What should you and I do? We should identify with Christ in baptism. That's what it means. It means to identify with him. And if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, then you need to be baptized to show that you're a follower of Jesus. This is the putting on of his uniform, as it were. This is the outward putting on of Christ. It's the outward demonstration of what has taken place inwardly. You need to identify with Christ in baptism. And when, when Jesus identified with John's message, when Jesus submitted to baptism, what happened? The heavens opened. And here's the first of three times that God speaks in an audible voice from heaven. And we don't know who could hear it, who could understand it. We know that Jesus did. And so we have the next word here is revelation. Revelation. As Jesus is baptized and prayed. Did you catch that? Luke's the only one who tells us that. That Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. That's when God speaks. When you are obedient to God and in fellowship with God, that's when God moves. Jesus submits. Here, the sinless son of God, you you think if, if the sinless son of God, the Messiah, would submit to baptism, how much more should I? If the son of God, who is in perfect fellowship with the father, if he prays, how much more should I? And this, what do you think he's praying? You think he's asking God for anything? I think if he's asking God for anything, it's simply that God would be glorified in him. But he's in fellowship with God. Our best and greatest praying is not when we're begging God. It's when we're loving God, when we're, when we're speaking to him and we're expressing to him our worship, our adoration, and our pray. And when Jesus is baptized, he's in communion with his father. He's talking to him. He's loving on him. He's submitting to him. He wants God to be glorified in him. And God speaks. And he speaks in the second person, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. My. Can you imagine? Oh, we want God to speak to us. Oh, we want to have some knowledge that nobody else has. Listen, what more can he say than to you he has said? You have the word of God. You have the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. The Bible itself says you have everything you need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called you to glory and virtue, that by these exceeding great and precious promises, you can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. You have everything you need because you have Jesus. Could you dare look at God and say, I'm so glad you gave me Jesus, but I need something else. I'm so glad you've given me your word, but I just need more. 
God has given you what he needs in Jesus, his son, and in his perfect, infallible, inerrant word, and you take the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and the perfect word of God, and it's given you everything you need to know how to be married, even though marriage is hard, and how to be a church member, even though being a good church member is hard, and how to be a good worker on the job, even though that is hard. God has given you what you need. What you need to do is accede, accede to the Holy Spirit. You see, he is telling you right now to accept Jesus. Or he's telling you right now to identify with Jesus in baptism. Or he's telling you right now you need to be a part of the Jesus community that is Buck Run. He's telling you right now you need to live for Jesus and, and like Jesus. And, and if need be, lose your head for the glory of Jesus. You know, we're all shaped by the people that are in our basement and in our balcony. People in your basement are the people from your past, people maybe who have wounded you, people who've hurt you. And the memory of those people and what they've done and maybe mistakes you made with those people, they, they tend to pull you down, down into the dark, the dank, the damp of the basement. But by God's grace, he's given us people in the balcony, people who cheer us on and people who encourage us and say, I'm with you, I'm praying for you, you can do this. Hey, look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. And you know, the Holy Spirit, like no one else, testifies to who we are in Christ. And he puts those people in our lives that, that urge us to be obedient to the Lord. God still speaks. He speaks through his word. He speaks through his witness. He speaks through people. But you must accede to the Holy Spirit. You have to be willing to say, Lord, whatever you direct me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit. I, I'm, I'm not going to hold out. And then you have the declaration of God. God speaks. God says, this is my son. Listen to him. This is my son. I'm, I'm pleased with him. And when God speaks of his son, you need to listen to God. Because God only speaks to us through and about his son. I, I gave up a long time ago. I don't argue with people when they tell me they heard the audible voice of God. But here's what I know. You can live your whole life and not hear the audible voice of God and die completely in the will of God because you've read his word. You might hear the audible voice of God. The truth is, I, that might be you overheard somebody else. It might be. You had the impression it was audible. I don't know. Here's what I know. God's word is enough. God speaks to us. This is what Hebrews 1 says. It says God in the past spoke to us in many different ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in a son. Only his son can include us in the people of God. Listen to God. You might hear the message of repentance and agree that you've got much to repent of. You might even think, there's no hope for me. What, how can I be saved? How can I be a part of the kingdom? How can I be a part of the covenant people of God when I've got so much in my past, so much I've done, so many mistakes I've made here? Remember, John exhorted them and he gave them good news. And that's that the Messiah is bringing the kingdom. And that kingdom doesn't depend at all on what you've done. That kingdom depends completely on what he's done. See, God could never be pleased with you because of your good deeds. But if you'll come to Jesus, if you'll repent of your sins, if you'll say, Lord, I could never save myself, I could never be good enough, I could never repent enough, but I'm trusting you. God will be pleased with you as though you were as righteous as Jesus because God can only be pleased with you because he's pleased with Jesus. That is God's son. Hear him.